saying must must be heard, of course. <laughs> okay, we are we are going to get started, even as people are coming on. I'm just going to do my introduction. Um, you know, first of all, good morning. Thanks for being here today. Um, this is our final webinar of 2023, and so we are really happy to have such a big turnout um, for today's presentation. Um, today, uh, our presentation is going to be a virtual training session um, to learn about various social engineering attacks and the techniques to protect your credit union. So what we've seen is that businesses across the country um, have seen a huge spike in cyber attacks since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we're now beyond. But um, when we saw this shift from the hybrid working format for many organizations, we saw that cyber criminals were taking advantage of employees um, in businesses that may be less vigilant while their employees are working remotely. And in addition to that, just in general, social engineering schemes have become much more elaborate and much more complex and much harder to identify. Um, so we have with us today, and very, very lucky to and happy to, Joseph Ellis from Conetrix, and he's going to provide you the strategies to help identify these social engineering attacks that we're talking about, um, explain about what some of these attacks are, and also how to modify your behavior to prevent falling victim to these ploys. Um, Conetrix is a full service computer networking security and compliance firm built on the principles of integrity, innovation and initiative. They specifically serve financial institutions as well as enterprises requiring a high level of security in their operations. Joseph Ellis, who's with us today, has experience performing IT audits for community financial institutions with technology woven into his professional work experience for over 20 years. As part of the Boost Consulting team, Joseph assists financial institutions in developing and maintaining their information security program, including business continuity planning, ISO support, risk assessments, cybersecurity policies, and vendor management. Um, before we begin, uh, just a quick note about today's format. Following Joseph's presentation, we're going to have time for a Q&A, so feel free to send your questions during the presentation via the chat box that's in uh, usually found in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And once Joseph concludes, we will go through those questions um, as they come in. And that is enough out of me. Joseph, I'm going to hand it over to you. All righty. Well, thank you, Erica. I appreciate that. Um, glad everybody's here. I'm sorry that I can't see you all. Uh, I'm used to speaking to uh, live audiences face to face where we can crack jokes at each other and laugh and enjoy our time together. Now I just get to look into this webcam. Uh, so that's, a, that's a little bit different, but I'm glad everybody's here and we'll get going. I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I am the manager of our Boost Consulting team uh, here at Kinetrix. I've got four kids, uh, Eric and I were just talking about that, uh, age 26 down to 14, uh, and we've done some foster care stuff, so we call those bonus kids. We have a, a good collection of bonus kids uh, that we've had the privilege to, to spend time with and, and care for. Um, I've been a registered nurse, worked in critical care for a while, all the, the life and death uh, type stuff. That was a, a, a blessing. That was a, a, a great time of life. Uh, and then after that, I was a landlord uh, for rental properties and I did all the maintenance work and I wore steel toed work boots and hung sheetrock and did all the painting and all the plumbing and electrical. Um, and now I'm an information security consultant. So talk about, you know, some kind of diverse career paths of this is my third career and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, for fun, I like to do uh, woodworking. I have a, a wood shop uh, behind my house and my, my latest uh, toy slash tool is a CNC router, a computer controlled router, so I can really use technology in my woodworking uh, endeavors now. And that's, that's kind of a lot of fun. And uh, I was born and raised here in West Texas the best Texas, we like to call it. And I bet you can't tell by my accent. I don't have an accent. Um, everybody else does, but we in West Texas, we don't. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, we can move on to talk and talk and tell you a little bit about uh, who we are, who our company is, uh, just very briefly. 
Uh, under this name, Conetrix, we actually have four separate companies, and you see them there on your screen. Uh, accounting where they, guess what they do? They develop accounting software. Uh, we have Conetrix Technology, which is an MSP, a managed services provider. Uh, they do all the network engineering, firewall management, patch management, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Tandem creates a, a suite of online software that's used for uh, managing your information security program. Uh, but I am part of Conetrix Security. Uh, Conetrix Security is made up of our auditors, which I used to be. I used to be one of our uh, part of our audit team. Uh, we have our pen testers and and sort of hackers. Um, they're they're the guys that you know see what they can get away with, see how far into your network they can get. Um, they're they're the wizards. They're the Jedi's of of the group. Uh, and then we have Boost Consulting, and we are the the teachers, the explainers, the consultants uh, that can come alongside and uh, help people make the most of their information security programs. Uh, just real quick about this presentation. Uh, you should be hearing everything by now. I uh, hope you're hearing some good audio by now. And if you're not, we often suggest that you call in, dial in if, if you need to. Uh, as Erica mentioned, we'll have time for questions at the end of this session. Uh, and uh, these slides and, and recordings and things will be made available to you by Erica afterwards. So no, no, uh, no anxiety there. Uh, and just real quickly, I do want to say that this presentation is for your information only. Uh, be careful about any uh, decisions that you make based on this presentation. Uh, it contains only my opinions. I'm, they're just kind of my weirdo opinions. They don't necessarily reflect those of Kinetrix, and it is proprietary, so don't uh, release this in an unauthorized manner. Okay, every presentation, every good presentation nowadays needs an agenda. Obviously, they are obligatory. Uh, so first, we're just very quickly, we're very quickly going to talk about some of the basics of an information security program in this information security world that we live in nowadays. Uh, you know, it's one thing to try to run your business, run your credit union, engage with your members and provide your services. But behind all of this is this information security world. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the, those foundational elements. Uh, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the presentation, talking about uh, us humans, the human element, the human part of information security. Uh, we're going to talk about some social engineering scams and shenanigans. And, and then finally, uh, we're going to talk about what can we do? How can we how can we improve? How can we be stronger? How can we be better in this context? OK, so let's get moving. Uh, first of all, let's talk about information security, these foundational elements. Um, of course, we, we need to define information security and the FFIEC, the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, has a good definition for us. And it's information security is just that process by which we protect our information. To cut it short, to, to summarize that definition, uh, we identify and prioritize our sensitive information and we do what we can to protect it. That's the process of information security. Now, this may seem kind of like a no-brainer. You know, why, why are we even talking about this or highlighting this or highlighting the definition of this? And the reason I am is because often in my consulting work with my clients, I find it helpful to highlight the distinction, the difference between information security and cybersecurity. Those are actually slightly different things. We often conflate them. We often kind of consider them the same thing, but they're actually slightly different. Cybersecurity is a subset or a piece or a part of information security. And cybersecurity, according to NIST, has to do with protecting our information from attackers. Uh, it, is, it is a defensive act. It's not merely protecting information and having good practices and, and you know, practicing information security. This is actually defending against attackers. There are bad guys out there that want your information. They want to harm you. Um, and so cybersecurity has to do with actually putting our shields up and guarding against those enemies. That's, that's the difference. That's the difference between cybersecurity and information security. Uh, so speaking of attacks, attackers, and the threats they pose, 
Let's look very quickly at a picture of the information security program as a whole. And that starts with the identification of threats, threats to our organization. These threats can be in the form of natural threats, natural disasters, weather, storms, snow, ice, fire, all those sorts of things. Uh, we can have internal threats. Uh, we can have mistakes uh, inside our organization, errors. We can have malicious actors inside our organizations, uh, all sorts of things like that. And then, of course, we have external threats. And these are very rough categories. You can you can go down the rabbit hole for any of these and get more, more granular. But roughly speaking, those are the sorts of threats that we face. And as we identify and prioritize those threats, we start throwing controls at them in the form of risk assessments. We document and prioritize these, these threats and write these risk assessments. And in these risk assessments, we identify controls, uh, barriers, shields, protections to help reduce the risk uh, that our organization faces just, just by existing, just by existing and providing the services that we provide to our members we incur risk, we are exposed to risk. And so we wanna put up some shields, some protections, some controls, and these controls can take all sorts of forms. Uh, often we start with policies, uh, our marching orders from uh, upper management or the board. Um, the policies are our directives that say, you need to do this, you need to protect that. Um, and then from these policies, we develop further controls, including technical, and physical controls. Uh, we have door locks, we have security cameras, we have firewall rules, we have network configurations, we have access controls, all those sorts of technical and physical controls that we put in place. Uh, nowadays, uh, more and more, we are outsourcing so many of our parts and pieces of our information security program. We're outsourcing those things to third party service providers or vendors. And so, of course, we need to have a really good, robust vendor management program where we vet those vendors, we monitor them, we make sure that they are doing the job that they say they're doing, that they are doing it effectively, efficiently, and that they are stable and strong and dependable. And they're not just going to uh, pull the rug out from under us and leave us hanging. Uh, we also have our plans in place for when things break, and they do break. Uh, things do break. We do have disasters, and so we need to have proper planning. So we have our business continuity plans. We have our disaster recovery plans, incident response plans, all those sorts of things. And then finally, another level of control is employee training. And of course, that's what we're doing here today. We're going to spend some time uh, equipping and strengthening all of you, uh, all of us. I need this too. We all do. Uh, we all need training and strengthening and guidance in this effort because we are all, every single one of us, is responsible for information security. We all are. We all have our parts to play. So we need good, solid training on an ongoing basis. And so once we've applied all these controls, we put them all into place, of course, we need to verify that they are working properly. And that's where we have our testing, our audits, and our pen testing. Uh, all those sorts of things, our scans, our vulnerability assessments. Uh, that's where we verify that the controls that we have in place are indeed effective, that they are providing the security and the risk mitigation that we need, that we intend them to provide. So that's what a, a generic textbook information security program looks like, sort of on paper. Uh, that's kind of the model for an information security program. And it looks very, uh, very comprehensive and multifaceted, and it is, it is. There are lots of parts and pieces involved in this. We in the information security industry, this, this, is, this is where we live. This is what we do all day, every day, is manage all these parts and pieces of the information security program. Uh, but for today, for our context today, the most significant element of this picture uh, is us, it's you. Uh, it's you human people. Uh, this is this is the part that we're going to be spending time on. And this is the part that we really, uh, we in the information security world, are finding more and more that we need to spend more time on. We need to focus more on our humans 
Uh, we've got technical controls all over the place. We have no shortage of technical controls and technology and sophistication and rules and gadgets and gizmos. Um, but our people, our people need help. We all need help. Um, a lot of us are real pieces of work and uh, we need all the help we can get. So let's talk about humans. Let's talk about people from an information security perspective. A uh, funny quote that I, I found uh, is from Charles Schultz. Uh, you, you may know him, you may know that name. Uh, he's the creator of the Peanuts cartoons, the Peanuts comics, Snoopy and uh, Charlie Brown and all those folks. Um, and this quote is attributed to him. And of course, nowadays you can look up quotes on the internet and you know, you can find 16 websites that all say, yeah, that person said that quote, but then you find out no. Uh, but anyway, this quote is attributed to Charles Schultz. Charles Schultz. Uh, he says, I love mankind, but it's people I can't stand. And that's that's often what we come across in our information security world is that we love the people we work with, we love our organization, we love our teams, but man, we <laughs> we can make some bonehead moves, we can make a lot of mistakes. And so let's talk about that, the problem with people. According to Verizon's latest uh, data breach investigations report, um, if you're a note taking kind of person, take note of this. If you haven't heard of this before, uh, Verizon's DBIR, they come out with this every year. Um, and it is, an, it is a well-regarded, highly regarded, uh, highly respected industry publication uh, they come out with every year. And it's it's actually kind of fun to read. They put a lot of funny little quips and little jokes and little comments in it, um, but it, it has really great information. And so fortunately, we're able to uh, reference this here at the end of 2023. We're, uh, we're fortunate to have their 2023 report available to us. And according to their latest research, it, they say that 74% of all breaches, all the breaches that they investigated, um, in this industry recognized document, a full three quarters of those breaches had to do with humans. It wasn't just a firewall failure and it wasn't just a, a rule that didn't get implemented or a safeguard that um, didn't get turned on or was misconfigured. No, a full three quarters of not just incidents, not just security incidents, but actual data breaches a loss or a compromise of information had to do with humans either acting maliciously or simply making mistakes. Three quarters of these things have to do with humans. Um, if you kind of look elsewhere in the rest of the world, if if some statistic came out, for example, that said, you know, 20 percent of automobile accidents were related to such and such thing, we would be all over that. I mean, 20 percent, that's a that's a huge percentage. If we could eliminate this 20 percent problem related to these auto accidents, that would be tremendous. Well, we're talking about 74 percent of these breaches have to do with us humans. So why is that? Why? Why do so many of these things involve humans? Why? Why are attackers targeting our people? Well, it's simple. It's because we fail. We, we're inconsistent, we're not robots. We are not technical rules that have been configured in a network diagram. We're, we're inconsistent. We, we make good decisions sometimes, we make bad decisions other times. We're, we're susceptible to persuasion. Um, people can wear us down, they can persuade us, they can convince us of things and, and we get tired. We get fatigued at the end of a long day we don't make the best decisions sometimes, and the attackers know this. And so they they devote a lot of time and attention to our people. So how do they do that? How do these attackers um, leverage human weaknesses uh, to effect their attacks, to, to have successful attacks? Well, Broadly speaking, the biggest way they do this is through social engineering. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So here we are, finally. That was all introduction. You're welcome. Here we are, finally getting to talk about social engineering. So what is social engineering? Well, according to CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, 
Um, in, in case you're not familiar with them, they are a very good resource uh, for all these sorts of things. They describe a social engineering attack as one in which an attacker uses human interaction or their social skills to obtain information. And they, they can be pretty convincing, it says they may seem unassuming and respectable. Uh, they might be pretending to have some sort of role uh, in your organization or uh, have some sort of relation or connection to you. And it's all fake. It's all deceit. It's all a lie, but it's social engineering. Um, they're playing on human emotion and reason um, and, and trying to exercise their persuasive skills uh, to engineer an outcome. Um, it's not too different from sales or politics or any other aspect of life in which we try to persuade people. Persuasion is not uh, necessarily an evil or bad thing, um, but as so, so many other things are, it can be twisted and used against us. That's what social engineering is. Uh, these are not merely the attacker, the, the hackers in the basement uh, using their coding skills to crack a password. No, these people come and talk to you. They come and talk to you face to face. They talk to you over the phone. They send you uh, persuasive and tricky emails through uh, this practice called social engineering. So we're going to talk about some of the more prevalent types of social engineering attacks. And, and one of them, one of the most prevalent ones is something that I'm sure you've you've heard of before, uh, and that is called phishing. And within the realm of phishing, uh, this this practice of of sending um, deceitful emails. We also have these ideas of spear phishing and whaling. I just wanted to bring these up in case you haven't heard of them. Uh, phishing generally has to do with sending out emails uh, en masse, just to hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of people, hoping that one percent of them will click on the link. Uh, that's that's phishing. It's easy. It's cheap. You can send out thousands of emails for next to nothing. Um, and if 1% of those people respond, well, that's that's a pretty good harvest. Uh, spear phishing, on the other hand, uh, is targeting particular individuals, um, particular members of management, or uh, somebody knows that you um, engage in business at this particular company, and they're gonna target all the uh, customers of that business. Uh, it's more targeted phishing, it's spear phishing. Uh, and then whaling has to do with going after the CEOs, the presidents. Um, man, if you can if you can get those people, if you can get access to their information and their resources, uh, then you've you've won the day. That's that's called whaling. They go after the whales. So just real quickly, I wanted to point those terms out to you in case you haven't heard of them before. And also just for fun, I came across this interesting uh, factoid for. Uh, those of you who, like me, are getting more and more gray hairs, uh, you may have heard the term freaking, uh, which sounds weird to say out loud. Um, but phishing, you might wonder, why is it spelled with a PH? Why that's weird? Why? Why? Uh, I understand phishing, I understand the term, but why is it spelled with a PH? Well, that comes from this term, uh, freaking. Uh, which had to do with some of the original hackers, the, the OG hackers back in the 60s and 70s. Back then, uh, the holy grail was to get free long-distance telephone calls. And these phone freaks, that's where the PH come from, comes from, it's from phones, telephones, um, would make little boxes, little gadgets uh, to, uh, to try to tap in and get free long-distance calling. And they were known as freaks. And so phishing uh, is an homage to that. So that's kind of fun. You can learn more about that uh, on the internet, of course, where all truth lies. So let's talk about talk more about phishing. Uh, again, according to CISA, uh, phishing occurs when criminals try to get us to open links, emails, or attachments that can uh, try to harvest more information from us or infect our devices with malware and ransomware. Uh, that's phishing. That's very, very prevalent. As I said earlier, it's very easy. It's very cheap. Um, nowadays, with the network technology that we have available to us, that the bad guys have available to them, um, 
they can send out thousands of emails to entire domains, to entire IP address ranges um, easily, freely, uh, essentially freely. Um, email, our, our email inboxes uh, are based on technology that goes back decades and decades and decades. We, we daily depend on decades old technology um, and these email inboxes are just open buckets, essentially, that just about anybody can throw mail into. Uh, just like your physical mailbox at home, uh, our email inboxes are just, they're just available. People can send us all sorts of things, and it's up to us. It's up to us humans uh, to use our intelligence, to use our decision making, to use our intuition even. Uh, to evaluate all these pieces of mail that we get and make good decisions about them. So let's talk about the kinds of decisions that we make with regard to these phishing emails. What do we need to watch out for? Uh, I've got a, a, a few screens here that we're going we're gonna to identify some of the things that we need to watch out for in phishing emails or suspected phishing emails. Uh, one of them has to do with receiving emails from an unknown or unexpected sender. Uh, you need to watch out for this. If you are not expecting an email about your auto insurance and you indeed receive that email about your auto insurance, um, be wary, be wary. Uh, these emails can come from outside your organization. Um, they can come from an incorrectly spelled or weirdly spelled domain name. Uh, domain name is the, the .com address that, that all your emails come from. Um, you know, they might they may take a well-known domain like apple.com, for instance, uh, but replace the L in Apple with a number one. And just looking very quickly, you don't notice that. And you get this email from apple.com and you say, oh, well, I've got an Apple account. You click the link and boom, they've got you. Um, unsolicited messages, things you weren't expecting. You didn't request this information. Why are you sending me this information? Again, be wary. Be wary of these things. And especially nowadays, um, this is this is a perfect time to talk about this. There are these seasonal scams. Uh, I think we've all gotten these messages that say, you know, UPS is not able to deliver your package. Click this link to arrange a re-delivery attempt. Um, and of course, these can come in text messages as well. We're largely talking about email here today, but this pertains to our text messages. Um, watch out for these seasonal things. The bad guys leverage this. They take advantage of of seasonal concerns uh, in order to try to trick us. Um, tax season is another one where you'll get an email from the IRS, you know, like the email, like, like the IRS is gonna email you, uh, but you get these emails from the IRS saying, oh, there's a problem with your tax return, click here to resolve it. Um, and you know that, that can be tricky, that can catch some people off guard. So beware of these seasonal scams. Uh, next, we need to watch out for this sense of urgency. They always like to put in this, this time pressure because they want to short circuit your critical thinking. They, want to, they, they don't want you to think about these things critically. They don't want you to take your time. They want you to hurry up, make a decision, click the link, click, click, hurry, hurry, get, it, get going. Um, because they might say, you know, uh, I, I need help, I'm stuck, I'm stranded, or your account is going to be locked or suspended. Uh, or you're going to be charged these fees. Um, you get these emails that say, uh, I, I noticed a $4,000 charge on your credit card, and we thought we better check with you before we allow this charge to go through. Uh, if you don't agree with this charge, click this link now. And so you say, well, my God, no, I don't want $4,000 charged on my credit card. And so you click the link, and now you're in trouble. Um, and a lot of times they'll have these messages that say, "By the end, this needs to be taken care of today. By the end of the business day, or else there's there are going to be these consequences." So, in any email or any any message that has a sense of urgency or a time limit um, or a hurry, hurry, hurry type message, be wary. Watch out for that. Be careful. That's a red flag. That's a warning. Now it could be legitimate. There there could be something really going on that has a sense of time pressure to it. But again, be careful. Uh, next, uh, watch out for emails that have links to click on, of course, or 
attached files. Uh, oftentimes you'll get an email that has a little attachment, some little some little graphic or a little file or a little thing. Um, of course, the bad guys want you to click on everything and then and you'll notice that in these phishing emails, there will be a thousand different links to click. There'll be so many links to click in there. Um, and you may see these links as the blue underlined text, but they can also just make the graphics in the email into links. And they're not blue and they're not highlighted and they're not underlined. Um, so just be really, really careful about clicking on anything in these emails. Uh, and of course, with these files that they attach, we need to be extra careful. So just as an aside, um, I want to highlight the fact that this, this slide in particular, this idea in particular of links and attached files is particularly important um, because they can often lead to what? What what do these links and attached files often lead to that we hear so often about in the news? Well, that is ransomware. Uh, ransomware is a real thing. Uh, ransomware is where uh, somebody, some person in an, or in an organization, could be anybody, could be anybody in an organization, uh, clicks on a link, downloads a file, and that file turns out to be a ransomware file which then crawls through your organization's network and encrypts everything. Doesn't necessarily steal it or remove it, but encrypts it and makes it unavailable for use. It might as well be gone. It might as well be erased. Um, and according to Verizon, they say that ransomware uh, is still at the top of the heap as far as uh, attack vectors. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight here is that ransomware, according to Verizon, again, is ubiquitous among organizations of all sizes and in all industries. Um, if you find yourself thinking something along the lines of, I, "I'm I'm a little fish, I'm I'm small potatoes," there the hack there there's nothing that the hackers want from me. You, to to put it bluntly, you're wrong. That's that's wrong. The attackers won't want to get anything and everything that they can. If they can encrypt and hijack a small mom and pop grocery store and get a $50,000 insurance payment from them, they'll take it. Sure, they'll take it. Um, they're not just going after U.S. government agencies and, you know, the big, big organizations, J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. No, they're going after everybody in all industries, all organizations. So I wanted to highlight that. Uh, and then also, according to Verizon, uh, this decades old technology that we all use, this email technology that we use, uh, we're, we're stuck with it for the time being, at least uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, think about what these bad guys have available to them. And Verizon, uh, in this report, they highlight that the convenience of sending you malware and having you run the malware for the bad guys it is just gold for them. I mean, my goodness, I, I hand you a bomb and you detonate it for me. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's what we're looking at here. Um, it is, it is absolutely evil. It is absolutely deceitful. Um, this is not a game. This is not uh, it's not going away anytime soon, and the bad guys know it. And they're they're leveraging email and and their social engineering skills to get us to click on things um, with with everything they have. They're devoting all their resources to these types of attacks. Um, and just real quickly, I think we've got time. I'll share a story um, with a, a company that that we have worked with in the past. We at Kinetrix have worked with in the past. Um, they're not a financial institution. Um, they got infected with malware, and I don't know exactly how, um, other than that somebody clicked on a link and downloaded a file, um, which is a nightmare in and of itself, okay? So your organization is shut down. You can't access your information. Um, you can't serve your customers. You can't serve your members. You're, you're out of business for the time being. Uh, fortunately, this organization had good backups. Um, they didn't have to pay off the bad guys. They simply said, okay, you, you can keep our encrypted files, whatever. Um, we're just going to restore from backups. So that's great. Good for them. 
um, during this multi-day process, days and days it took them to clean off all their machines, get rid of all the infected software, rebuild all their machines, all the new software installation. They had to, you know, make sure that there wasn't any ransomware left in any of their network. Then restore all their backup information. It took days and days. They were out of business uh, during these days uh, while they were restoring everything. But during this restoration process, they missed one machine. Um, it was just it was powered off or or forgotten about off in an office somewhere. Uh, was not included in the restoration process. When they powered everything back on, were ready to launch their business again, get everything going again. That one machine that was not included in the restoration process reinfected their whole network, shut them down again. Um, and, and I'm sure the bad guys were just laughing their tails off because they, they got a two for one. They they got to infect this organization twice. Um, so rants, and, and that's not to pick on this organization. That was just a, just a mistake. Somebody made a mistake. That happens. Um, but that's more to highlight the seriousness uh, of ransomware. Um, th this is this is deadly serious. This is a, a big deal. So. Uh, I apologize for for bringing down the room, but uh, I do want to highlight that uh, with that little aside. So back to our phishing topic. Uh, be careful. Be careful about those links and attached files. Um, if you're not expecting it, if you weren't, if you didn't solicit this information, be very, very careful about clicking on anything or opening any files. Uh, and then finally, with regard to phishing, another thing to watch out for, and this is where intuition comes into play. Uh, something just doesn't seem right. Uh, we, we use the term spidey sense. Your spidey sense goes off. Um, something just doesn't feel right. Um, that's not normally how Sally writes her emails. Um, you know, my, my insurance agent has never sent me an email before telling me to click on a link. That, that's weird. That's strange. Um, you get these unusual requests from, say, your boss, where they say, hey, I need you to use your company card to go buy $1,200 worth of, you know, <laughs> Apple gift cards <laughs> and send me the codes to those Apple cards or whatever. That's that's weird. My boss has never asked me to do. Really? Do you, you really want me to do that? So be careful, careful and, and, and you know, uh, take heed of your intuition. If something seems weird, uh, let that give you pause. Let that let that red flag mean something. It doesn't mean that everything's falling apart and the world's about to explode necessarily. Um, but don't don't disregard it too easily. If something doesn't seem right, um, slow down. Take a beat. Um, Pay, pay extra close attention if something seems wrong or if your spidey sense goes off. Okay, so just to sum up with regard to phishing, these phishing emails, watch out for unknown senders, uh, especially a sense of urgency, a time pressure. They try to short circuit your critical thinking. Um, be extra careful about clicking on anything, any sort of links or attached documents. Um, and and pay attention to your to your gut. <laughs> pay attention to your gut feeling uh, about these messages. Uh, that can be very valuable. There's there's any number of stories of um, potential hacks, potential attacks that were thwarted by somebody's somebody just not feeling right about something and investigating it further and finding out that yes, indeed, that was a scam. That's that's very helpful. So that's the big one. That's that's the one that we spent a lot of time on there is phishing, of course. Um, but let's talk about some other things, some other scams and, and some things for you to be aware of. Um, all of this is within the realm of social engineering. This is all the bad guys using their social skills, uh, either in person, over the phone, or through email or text messages to, to trick you, to persuade you. This is all social engineering. Uh, we talked about our phishing emails and the right somewhere that can be attached to those uh, and all sorts of other things. But let's talk about some other social engineering type attacks. Uh, one is called pretexting. 
Um, and this is this word, this term is not limited to the realm of information security. A pretext, a false pretext, uh, is just it, simply put, it's just a lie. Uh, do you know bad guys lie? <laughs> they lie to you. They try to trick you. They pretext. Um, and in this realm, in this context, we talk about them developing a scenario, some sort of story, some sort of some sort of tale that they try to get you to buy into. Um, and if they can get you to buy into a story, a scenario, and, and get you on the same page at least, they haven't even launched an attack yet. They haven't even tried to harm you yet. Um, but they, they get you engaged with their story. And, and once you're on the same page and you're listening and you're, you're on the same page with them and you're participating in their, uh, their web of lies, their stories, uh, well, then that will help them be more successful in their actual, actual attack that they launch later. Uh, as I've said, this can be done in person, face to face, at, at a, in a customer service uh, environment, uh, at the teller line. Uh, this this can be face to face. It can be online through email or websites, uh, and it can be done over the phone by voice. And we're going to talk about voice here in a little bit as well. Uh, some example scams in this realm include the tech support scam. Uh, that especially targets um, our elderly population, our parents and grandparents, uh, where they will send an email uh, or even make a phone call and say, hey, uh, I'm calling from Microsoft or I'm writing to you from Microsoft and I see that your machine is infected with a virus. Uh, here, click this link and we'll get you with tech support and help get rid of that virus from your computer. And what they really do is they get you to click a link and give the attackers remote control of your computer as our tech support people often do in our organs sometimes they need to get on our computer and just control it and that's that's fine that's legitimate but these bad guys will use that then to gain access to our loved ones computers um, and often have them log into their bank accounts and things like that and harvest all sorts of information that way that's the tech support scam um, any sort of manufactured crisis, any sort of urgent explosion or disaster, uh, they might write to somebody and say, oh my goodness, this horrible thing is happening in the world and only you can help. Please call this phone number if you, if you are a nice human and want to help other people in the world. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's especially terrible because they're leveraging the fact that bad things do happen in the world and oftentimes we do want to help. Um, but they will, they'll take advantage of that situation in order to uh, commit fraud and, and steal our money and our information. Uh, there are these scams where, of course, you, you didn't even know you had this long lost uncle in Moldovia um, and he passed away and, and wouldn't you know it, you are his only heir um, and he left $6 million worth uh, uh, of an estate um, and if you could please just send us $2,000 as a holding fee, then we'll make sure that you get your $6 million. And of course you lose that $2,000 and they're happy to take that from you and move on. And then of course there's the Nigerian print scam that's been around forever and ever, but uh, as, as with all these other things, they morph and they change. Um, and there's, there's always somebody in some far flung land that is reaching out to you to help for some reason, for some reason they've reached out to, to me in West Texas um, to, to help them with some political unrest that they're dealing with or something else. Because that's all pretexting, that's all storytelling, that's all uh, scenarios that they lay before you uh, in order to hopefully trick you into uh, engaging with them and ultimately sending your money to them. Uh, another one is business email compromise. Uh, you often just hear it uh, referred to as BEC about BEC is on the rise uh, and according to Verizon it is indeed on the rise business email compromise attacks have almost doubled they've almost doubled just in the past year uh, again if you think of anything else in the world that doubles in one year that is substantial that is very meaningful so what is that what is business email compromise what's the big deal well think about it uh, so much of what we do is related to our email inbox. Um, banking activities, um, verification of your identity, 
Uh, oftentimes, if you sign up for a new account or try to log into a new website and you give them your email address, what do they do? They send you a verification email because only you should be in control of your email inbox, right? And that proves that proves that I'm Joseph. If I sign into a, a, a website and they send me a confirmation email saying, hey, we want to make sure that this is, in fact, your email address and I click the link. Yeah, that's me. OK, well, that's a verification tool that they have and that's fine. But what if somebody has access to your email inbox? And you may not even know it. They may be logging into your email inbox and not doing anything for a while. Just, just reading your email, just watching the threads that are going back and forth. Um, that, that really gives, and I put here on the screen, that, that gives the bad guy the keys to the castle. Think about everything that they have access to. Um, if they can get a hold of a VP's email address, or the president or CEO's email inbox. Um, think about the, the, the havoc that they could cause. Um, oftentimes, as we see here at the bottom, uh, they'll use this to uh, monitor email threads and eventually inject themselves into that thread and say, hey, actually, um, can, we, can we divert these funds? Uh, here's my new bank account number. Um, I, I'd like these funds to go to this new account, please. And they say, okay, sure, yeah, seems legit. And boom, they've got the money. Uh, this happens in uh, real estate transactions often. Think about the closing fees and down payments. Um, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars are getting stolen through business email compromise. Another one to talk about is open source intelligence or OSINT. Uh, nowadays with social media platforms, um, that we so readily share all of our details and, and information on, uh, the bad guys use that and they they research you. They'll research the president of your credit union. They'll research, uh, they'll find out who you are on LinkedIn and then look you up on other platforms and they will gather information about you and they'll use that information to harm you. Um, they'll combine that information that they've learned through some channels with what they learned through other channels, and they are really sophisticated. Um, one of our former auditors actually does a presentation just on this topic. Um, and for fun, he will usually get the, the moderator of the presentation or the event, um, and, and with their permission, he will learn everything he can about that person, and, and it's, it's often quite unnerving. Uh, because we we so readily share all this information about ourselves out there in public. So open source intelligence uh, is a real thing. It's a real tool that bad guys use every day. Uh, this next one is <laughs> um, not very pleasantly named, but it is a, a real thing that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, this is a very complicated deal that that takes place over weeks and months, typically. And it's where they will get somebody to invest money somewhere. They'll say, hey, man, I've got this sure thing. I've got this investment. It's it's producing 18% annually. Um, you know, this, this is a great investment you can get into. And if you want to, Bob, let's say Bob. Uh, Bob, you know, just, just, just invest $500. Just put in $500 and watch it. And then what they'll do is Bob will be able to log into a website and he'll watch his $500 grow. And I'll say, man, this, and, and again, this happens over weeks and months. The, the attackers are not in any hurry. In fact, they want this to go as slowly as possible. Um, and Bob will watch his $500 grow and he'll say, my goodness, this is going great. Let me, you know what? I've got $50,000. I'm ready to put into this thing. And so he will. And again, he will watch that investment grow and grow and grow. And he will invest more and more until Bob finally starts to feel like something is wrong, something's amiss. And once once the victim or the pig has been fattened enough and has become suspicious, well, then the, the jig is up, the con is off, um, and the, the bad guy flees with all the money, and Bob has lost whatever money he's put into that. It was all fake. It was all a lie, um, again, for a long period of time. Um, people have lost life savings doing this it is it's horrible uh the impact that this is having on people um terrible name terrible practice um that's that's a real thing out there 
And then finally, I want to bring to your attention uh, this stuff that's on the horizon and indeed already here through artificial intelligence and machine learning. We are getting these voice cloning services that are kind of fun. They're kind of neat. They're kind of fun to play with. You can do that uh, for just a few dollars. You can submit uh, some samples of your voice and these AI websites can make a clone of your voice and you can and it's, it's fun to play with. It's kind of fun. It's kind of neat. But bad guys are using this uh, to uh, make fake phone calls to people in the voice of their loved ones saying, help, I've been arrested or I've been kidnapped uh, or I'm in this horrible situation and I, I need you to send $25,000. I need you to send $100,000 uh, to help me to get me out of this. And these can be done in real time. The, the recipient of this phone call can say, oh my goodness, well, where are you? Well, immediately the bad guy can tell the robot, the voice clone robot to say, I, I'm, you know, I'm in Missouri, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. And they can have a conversation with the victim over the phone and trick the victim into spending lots and lots of money, losing lots and lots of money. And they're becoming more and more convincing over time. They really are. So real quick, finally, finally, where the rubber meets the road, what can we do? Now, of course, we can spend all sorts of time talking about this, but I want to keep this really simple, really to the point. Um, and, and you can put this into practice right now, today. For the rest of the day today, you can put these things into practice to make you and your credit union more secure. And that is first to be watchful. Um, Erica used the term vigilant earlier. Uh, be watchful. Pay attention. Those bad guys are watching you. They really are. You need to be watchful too. Uh, something that I've alluded to several times is to slow down. Slow down. The bad guys often will try to send these messages right before lunch or right before the end of the day. And you just want to I, let me just get this done. I'll just click on this link and just get this done. I, I don't want to have to worry about it tonight. Uh, I, I don't want this to be waiting for me in the morning. Slow down. Take a breath. Take a beat. Pay attention to what you're doing. And finally, verify, verify, verify. There's this very famous quote out there in the world that I, I hijacked and changed a little bit. Be polite. Be professional. But don't trust anyone. There's this term zero trust. Verify everything before you click on something or do something. Make sure that it's legitimate. And that's it. Those three things that if, if we can all do this, these three things consistently, it will greatly increase the protection that we offer to ourselves and to our organizations. So that's it. That's what I have for you. We do have a few minutes left for questions. I'll be happy to answer those now. Thanks, Joseph. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. There was a few there that I didn't know about, like the pig sluttering I had never yeah. heard of. Um, that seems like a, how how would someone go about verifying that if, you, if they have a live website? Like, how would you, yeah. you know, that seems to be, uh, it's very seem, tricky. seeming like you are verifying it because <laughs> you're seeing it on a website, right? Yeah. And so that's where you do what, what we call out of band verification, out of band verification, meaning you, you go on a side channel, um, say this bad guy is talking with you through emails or through, uh, a web, you know, uh, some web environment or even on the phone. Um, and he says, man, I've got this new investment firm. Um, we're doing great, great returns. Well, you, out of band, you you sidestep, you come around to the side, and you you check references. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of this company before. Talk to your friends, mm. talk to advisors, talk to experts, talk to uh, you folks at the credit union. Have you guys ever heard of this investment firm, ABC Investment Firm? Is that a legit thing? Ask around, get references, and again, pay attention to your intuition. If something starts seeming weird, if nobody's heard of this investment firm before. That's a red flag. Pay attention. Be careful. That's one of those things. If it's if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. At least give yourself the opportunity to hear that it might be too good to be true. Investigate. Verify, verify, verify. 
So we did have a few questions come in that I will jump on. Um, somebody asked, is is a corrupt or malware link in an email more dangerous than a link from a web search? Is there any differentiation there? Uh, yes, a link that's in an email is exponentially, well, it's potentially exponentially more dangerous than a link on a web search, yes. Um, now, that does not mean that all the links from a web search are legitimate. Uh, bad guys will often pay Google or other search engines to uh, advance their malicious links, to put their malicious links at the top of the search stack. So they'll, they'll just pay for that, just like any other advertiser could. Um, but yes, the, the links that come into your email are exponentially more dangerous. Um, just because they're so easy. The bad guys just send out thousands and thousands and thousands right. of these all the time. Um, to, to pay to get their malicious links uh, elevated on a search result, first of all, costs more money and it's not as productive for the bad guys. So they're gonna put more effort and more time into those email links. So yes, uh, be careful about your search engine links. Do be careful, be, you know, be careful. Make sure that you're going to the website you think you're going to. Um, but email links are are especially fraught with peril. So you had spoken earlier about a ransomware attack where you gave the example of the company that, you know, they had backups. Mm -hmm. um, this question kind of pertains to that. They said, are there ways to recover from a ransomware attack without paying the ransom? Mm -hmm. um, so is one of the ways obviously having the backups, like you said, but are there other ways around that? Um, that's really the main thing. Um, okay. What ransomware does is it it prevents you getting access to your information. They basically mm -hmm. lock it away in a cage and you can't get it until you pay them and then they will decrypt the information for you, they say. Um, which actually, usually they do from what I hear. Um, but yeah, the, the way to get around that, the way to not have to pay for that is to simply say, you know what? I don't need you to decrypt my information because I have good, robust, verified Mm -hmm. backups. Um, it is so important to not only back up your information, but you need to verify that that, that those backups are intact and usable um, by, by doing tests, test recoveries. Um, th there would be nothing worse than thinking, no, I've got great backups. I don't, I don't need to pay you, you ransomware guys. Um, and then find out that, oh, nope, our backups got encrypted too uh, because we didn't protect them properly. Or uh, turns out we weren't backing up our information as well as we thought we were. So you need to have good, robust, verified backups. Right. And just to, I know we discussed this when we were planning this, that I had shared with you that my uncle was taken by one of those AI scams um, using the voice of his son. And then r shortly after you and I spoke, I saw that that actually is going before Congress to try to put protect, some types of protections in place for people who are being taken by that exact scam, which was, you know, my uncle receives a call with his son, what he thought was his son. They used his um, voice from a podcast that he had done, you know, locally. And then it was the, you know, he was drinking and driving and he hit a woman and they needed money to get him out. And I mean, it was really, you know, amped up, but they even had people calling him back from law offices and a police officer were calling, you know, and it, it was just such an emotional reaction on his part that he did lose a significant amount of money. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting to see that go before Congress, That, but it's that same scam and that same type of thing, because really this is a, a new age of of deception. So, um, yeah, so it is something that we need to be mindful of, especially with financial institutions, with people using, you know, voices to call in requests or, you know, wire transfers or, you know, withdrawals or, you know, any of those things. I mean, they're very real. So, um, yeah. yeah. And so again, those, you know, what can we do points, um, apply to those situations as well as right. best you can. I know, I know right. these are so frantic. This is such a frantic situation. Right. But right. As best you can, slow down, pay attention to what's going on, and verify as best you can. And, and again, I know um, uh, sometimes we we just get tricked. We we do. Well, yeah, and I mean, in hindsight, you know, he said he felt like such a fool, but when he was in the mix of it, hearing his son say, I need to get out of jail and we need to keep this from my employer. I mean, and you know, my uncle's older, 
um, you know, elderly. Um, it just it just happened. It was just the perfect person for it that he didn't he didn't couldn't think clearly because he was so yeah. overwhelmed by, you know, the, the real realness of what was happening. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, those are those are very real threats for sure. And then there's one last question, Joseph. How can you protect your devices when using a public Wi-Fi or hotspot? Oh, good question. Very good question. Um, first of all, <laughs> my first response is don't use public Wi-Fi, <laughs> period. Interesting. Um, okay. That's uh, a good one. <laughs> a hotel and a coffee shop, just do not use it. That would be my first and strongest, strongest recommendation. Um, just use your cellular data. Um, use your cell phone as a hotspot, pay for the data, um, just do that. Short mm -hmm. of that, if you're, you're, if you're a little bit more technically savvy and want to get into this, um, you can get your own, you can subscribe to what's called a VPN service, a virtual private network. Um, and that is where uh, you pay some fee. I do. I, I have a VPN service that I use personally. Um, that encrypts all the traffic coming from your laptop, your phone, whatever. Um, and it goes to uh, specifically configured servers that the VPN company owns uh, that can be all through the country and all over the world. And you can do all your internet communications to and from these VPN servers, which are encrypted and that the bad guys can't see or, or hijack. Um, but if you connect to a public Wi Fi without encryption, without um, a VPN, you could be connecting to a Wi-Fi network that a bad guy has set up in the coffee shop. Hmm. It's easy. You, anybody can do that. Anybody can right. uh, get what's called an access point and broadcast a Wi-Fi signal, and you can happily log into it and use it and do all your online banking and all these things, and the bad guy that owns that network can watch all your traffic. So first and foremost, don't use public. Don't. That's, a, that's, that's easy advice to take. <laughs> Just yeah. don't do it. Great. Well, I didn't see any other questions coming in, Joseph, but um, I wanted to thank you. This was a very thorough program and really went over the finer points of social engineering, and um, we really appreciate it. Um, you know, just uh, really... Uh, um, a good detailed presentation and I think the kind of information that we needed. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, for, for everyone on today, this um, webinar will be available. Um, the recording will be available for your your uh, teams um, early next week. Actually, no, should be actually probably available by, by, available by the end of the week. And um, I will let you know when that is available. And then also a copy of today's presentation deck is also going to be available. Um, and that's a wrap for 2023 for our training sessions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back here in 2024. Um, please reach out and let me know if there are any topics of interest or even urgency that you'd like me to cover next year. Um, we want to make sure these sessions are timely and relevant and covering the subjects that really matter to you and your organizations. So um, please drop me a line anytime. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year, and we'll see you in 2024. Thank you so much. Everybody. Joseph, thanks so much. I'll, uh, I'll drop you a quick email, but thank you. This was terrific. Oh, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thanks. And you take care. Thank you.